Welcome to No Rain Date, a community podcast about local news and people. No Rain Date is a production of Sock and Source, LLC. For more local news and information, please visit SockandSource.com. Hello, and welcome to another episode of No Rain Date, your local news and interview podcast. I'm Josh Popachak, the host of No Rain Date and the publisher of Sock and Source. Here with the headlines for April 17th, 2021, and episode 50. Lower Saucon Township has put out a call for public input on walking and bicycle connections in the township. If you're familiar with Lower Saucon, you know it's not exactly the most pedestrian-friendly community in the area. That's, however, typical of townships, particularly the more rural townships like Lower Saucon. Most of the township does not have sidewalks, and trails, as far as connections, are somewhat limited. So, in an effort to improve walkability and bikeability, Township officials applied for and received a grant for the state's WalkWorks program. And as part of this grant, they are required to seek public input. They are currently soliciting that, and they have a map that is interactive where you can pinpoint locations within the township where you think a sidewalk would be useful. For example, I noted in our story about this that somebody had recommended considering installing a sidewalk between McDonald's on Main Street and the giant shopping center about a quarter of a mile south on Route 412. This is a heavily traveled area by motorists, but also pedestrians. I've frequently noticed people who lack vehicular transportation walking back and forth, and part of the reason for that is the the Giant is really the only major full-service grocery store in the area, so many people have to get there one way or another. And other places within the shopping center for work or, or whatever the reason. So that was just one suggestion that was made. I think there were 12 or 15 the last time I looked at the map. If the issue of pedestrian access is important to you, I would certainly recommend checking out the map. The link is included in our story, which is on the Sock and Source homepage. There is still time to have your say and have it be heard by local officials. In springtime news, the Saucon Valley Farmers Market is gearing up for their 16th season. That will begin on opening day, which is Sunday, May 2nd. The Farmers Market will once again be held on the grass field next to the Hellertown Area Library, which is at 409 Constitution Avenue, right across from Dimmick Park in Hellertown. The market is open weekly from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. from early May through mid-November. And it's held rain or shine. There's plenty of free parking. The focus of our story about the upcoming market was the fact that volunteers are seriously needed. I've spoken to the farmer's market chairperson, the wonderful Angie Reese, recently and she explained that for a variety of reasons some of their most loyal and hard-working volunteers had to exit before the start of this season or take a break and so we need some other people to help fill those shoes. It's really a great opportunity I think if you're somebody who enjoys being outside, having you know a, the opportunity to socialize and learning more about our local producers, uh, growers, farmers, and other food-related cottage industries in the area, you will get to know the vendors at the Saucon Valley Farmers Market if you're a volunteer there, and and they are wonderful. It's a wonderful group. I know there are going to be some new vendors coming in this year. We will have coverage of that in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for those announcements. 
You can, of course, follow the Farmer's Market on Facebook and Instagram. More information about being a vendor and this year's vendor vendors will be at SaucomValleyFarmersMarket.com. I also want to mention that if you are interested in volunteering, some of the tasks that are performed weekly include setup of the tents, the canopies, that begins around 745 every Sunday, sign distribution throughout town. These sandwich boards are placed in strategic locations at busy intersections, and they help direct visitors to the market. Then tear down, which is at 1 p.m. every Sunday. They also need volunteers to help man the information booth. And they need volunteers for the Farmer's Market Committee, which is involved with things like booking the weekly live music acts, planning special events, and so forth. You'll find more information about all of those responsibilities in the story, which is on the Sock and Source homepage right now. You can email SaucomValleyFarmersMarket at gmail.com if you're interested in being a volunteer or, of course, connect with them through their Facebook page or the website. Also coming up is a free kids fishing tournament, which will be held in the Saucon Creek behind the Hellertown Sportsmen's Association on May 15th. This tournament is the Al Stair Memorial Fishing Tournament, and it's sponsored by the Sportsmen's Association. As I said, it's free for kids of all ages, up to teenagers. There is a registration form. The deadline to register is coming up fast. It's April 20th. The link to that form is included in our story, along with some information about the rules for the tournament and what will be taking place that day. It sounds like a lot of fun and a great opportunity to get outside, enjoy nature. The Saucon Creek is beautiful, especially this time of year. So I would encourage everybody to check that out and register as soon as possible if you're interested. Other upcoming events are related to Earth Day, which is April 22nd. Johnny Hart wrote a story highlighting just some of the events that are coming up in our area to coincide with that. Many of them, of course, are cleanups. There really was not much in the way of organized cleanups in 2020 due to the pandemic. So some areas I've noticed are particularly litter strewn. The uh, volunteers who are who are participating in these cleanups are going to have, I think, a long day. Hopefully they have plenty of bags. Unfortunately, it almost seems in some ways like the pandemic increased litter, but that could be an illusion based on the fact that there haven't been as many people out cleaning things up. Of course, PPE litter is a concern. I wrote about that in 2020. It's still a concern. I noticed a face mask (laughs) outside Dewey Fire Company actually on Thursday, and I instinctively went to pick it up, and then I stopped because I'm thinking, what could be on that? <laughs> and I was I was headed inside to a function, actually, two ribbon cuttings, which we will have a story about coming up, the ribbon cuttings for Frontline at the Dewey and Chef Meals. I'm digressing here, but my point is that the PPE litter is still out there. If you're somebody who is conscious of COVID and the spread, you know, please be careful. If you are collecting litter, you know, use gloves I would even wear wear a mask or consider doing that. I, I really hope that people will think twice before they litter. The pandemic brought a lot of us out into nature. There was nothing else to do for quite a period of time. So hopefully more people are appreciating our environment and wanting to protect it. That's a great goal to have. And I applaud everybody who will be participating in Earth Day cleanups and other events. It's a very worthy event. This is the 51st anniversary of Earth Day, so it's been around for a long time, but we shouldn't take it for granted, just like we shouldn't take the planet for granted. Finally, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to a story that Johnny wrote about local pool openings. After total shutdown in 2020, most local pools are planning to open in 2021 with COVID restrictions in place. The biggest challenge actually may be staffing pools. 
There is a lifeguard shortage, and Fountain Hill and Hellertown are both seeking applicants for the lifeguard positions. In Hellertown's case, the borough has contracted with the Greater Valley YMCA to manage the pool this year. So the YMCA will actually be handling the hiring of the lifeguards, and the borough will handle hiring employees for concessions and and some other areas. So that's a little bit different. The pool opening date in Hellertown is Saturday, June 12th. That's also a little bit later than normal. Typically, it's opening the day after high school graduation, which this year is June 4th. So if you're looking forward to the pool opening, put June 12th on your calendar. Pool passes, of course, are available for purchase. We have information about the cost of those passes in our story, and it's also on the Hellertown Borough website. So pool season not far off. Once we get through this little blast of cold air, I think spring will be here for good. So that's definitely something to look forward to. And that's our news roundup for the week ending April 17th, 2021. We will see you again next week, and thanks for listening. Every night, Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of No Rain Date, your podcast for local news and information. I'm Josh Popachak, the host of No Rain Date. And I'm Johnny Hart, the producer of No Rain Date. I said this is a special episode, and that's because we're celebrating a milestone. This is our 50th 5-0 episode, and in recognition of that achievement, we are going to talk a little bit about the history of the show, what motivates us to keep producing it every week, and we're going to look back on some of our favorite interviews that we've done. We've done more than 50 (laughs) and it's been a lot of fun too so we thought it would be in order to share some of those highlights and also talk about the future of the show of course we want to thank all our listeners for getting us to this point we would not have a successful podcast without you thank you and we hope you'll keep listening and tell your friends about us and also, if you ever have any ideas, we're, we're open to those, too. We'll start at the beginning. And the beginning for this podcast really goes back to early 2018. That was when I opened my office in Hellertown. And the idea of producing a podcast seemed more realistic. I do not have a background in podcasting. I don't have any type of technical background, and I really, to be honest, was not a huge podcast listener. I did listen to some, but they were more like in the true crime genre. Like, there was nothing really news-related in my podcast library. I guess, like, I was kind of influenced by news radio, primarily NPR. I've always listened to a lot of that, and I like the longer format news radio segments like Fresh Air, which I would kind of call like a magazine style show. And and that was sort of my vision for No Rain Date. I started, you know, asking around in 2018. I spoke to two or three people, but nothing clicked and I didn't have the skill set to move forward with it on my own. So Fast forward to October 2019, that was when I met Johnny, and the original plan was just for you to freelance mainly, and then I looked at your resume, and it included podcasting experience, so you can sort of take over the story from there. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I had actually attended Temple University and majored in media studies and production with a focus on audio production. So that was where my formal education began when it came to audio production. Upon graduating from Temple, one of the first things I started doing was working for a website that covers football called Inside the Hashes. Shortly after that, I started doing production work on their college football podcast, which is called Run Pass Option. So you could say that that podcast is kind of where my professional, you know, intro to audio production began. 
So as Josh mentioned, I started writing here at Sock and Source just as a freelancer in the beginning in October of 2019. But Josh had come across my background in audio production and the things I was doing at Inside the Hashes with that podcast. And that was when he sort of pitched the idea to me of starting a Sock and Source podcast. So, you know, I was on board with it from the beginning. I thought it was a good idea. It would be cool to build up a podcast from the ground up like that with someone. So we spent a couple weeks sort of hashing out the details of the show. What would the format be? What equipment would we use? And how would we start putting it all together? And shortly after that, we started inviting guests over to the office to record interviews. And we started putting out episodes. Right, right. There was not a lot of legwork, really, to get it going. We... Mm -hmm bought a microphone this beautiful blue (laughs) microphone which looks kind of retro you get comments about the it was always a big conversation piece when we had in-person interviews here Mm -hmm. uh because it has a sort of a retro vibe Mm -hmm. to it and and i like that Mm -hmm. i like older stuff so but more importantly it works great (laughs) and that was the main piece of equipment that we needed to get started and yeah as far as what johnny's been doing it's been fantastic it's expanded since day one and i love that you know you have a diverse skill set because in a lot of cases story subjects will evolve into podcast interviews Mm -hmm. and vice versa so the fact that you can write content for the site is a huge plus and you also of course do a lot of legwork on you know booking Mm -hmm. interview guests which takes a considerable amount of time there's a lot of planning that goes into this of (laughs) course you know we can't plan for everything but we try to be booked you know i would say a month out right in most cases you know but also have some flexibility built into the schedule because things do happen Mm -hmm. and uh, we look at the calendar and we think about you know what's going to be happening at that time of year. Of course, COVID has changed that somewhat because we don't have the normal flow of events yet. Right. And I don't know when when we'll be back to that. I did want to talk a little bit about COVID and the impact it has had on No Rain Day because it's been significant. We were only about four months into creating episodes when the pandemic began in March 2020 and it was abrupt that we basically had to stop producing episodes right maybe we didn't have to but I felt like we did because I did not want to focus on COVID-19 episode after episode Mm -hmm. we did one episode in which I interviewed the Saucon Valley superintendent of schools Dr. Craig Butler And then about a month later, we did a Zoom episode Mm -hmm. in which I interviewed several local business owners and Jessica O'Donnell from the Chamber of Commerce about how they were responding and adapting to the challenges of COVID-19. That was the only episode we've done where it was via Zoom. Yes. And I have to give a shout out to Kim Bjorheim who kind of set that up and and it it did work well Mm -hmm. i guess i prefer the regular format because it was a lot a lot going on for me with that episode but i'm very grateful that you know it worked out the way it did and Mm -hmm. and a lot of people continue to listen to that and i think in the future you know that'll be sort of an important time capsule for people to understand where things were at Mm -hmm. in the early stages of COVID-19. There was a lot of uncertainty. We were still in a lockdown at that point. And yeah, after that, there was a hiatus from about late April till late August. Correct. Yep. That roundtable, business roundtable episode came out on April 24th. And then on August 27th is when we returned with Chief Derek Richmond. That was episode 18. Right. So... Yeah, I mean, we we did lose momentum as far as listens and downloads. Obviously, that was difficult to to deal with. But, you know, safety is the most important thing. And and ever since we uh, came back to producing episodes, we have primarily done everything over the phone. Mm -hmm. We wear masks and we're very safety conscious when we're here in the quote unquote studio. (laughs) 
it hasn't compromised the sound quality nope. at all. I mean, maybe maybe a little bit with some of the phone interviews, but it's not to the point where it doesn't work. And so I'm I'm glad that we have the technology that we do to be able to continue to produce these episodes. I'll also be glad when I can have you know in person interviews again because mm-hmm. I love the ability to you know see somebody's body language and talk to them you know face to face yeah we definitely miss our in-person guests here at the office yeah and taking photos with them yeah right it's a more personal experience when you can interview somebody face to face so as a storyteller and, and a journalist that's something that i'll always prefer but you know we're not in any rush either to upset the apple cart and you know risk anybody's health so that sort of brings us up to the the present day i did also want to touch on the name for no rain date right which i think some people get the background but probably a a lot don't essentially around the time that we were thinking about launching the podcast there was a sort of kerfuffle or you know, a response to the cancellation of the 2019 Saucon Valley Spirit Parade in Hellertown. This was in October uh, 2019, and uh, it's the biggest parade of the year and probably the biggest public event of the year in Hellertown. And unfortunately, that year, there was just an incredible downpour on Parade Sunday. And so the parade was canceled because... There is no rain date for the <laughs> Saucon Valley Spirit Parade. There just isn't. That's for logistical reasons that I'm not going to get into, but they're valid reasons. And organizer David Heinzelman has talked about that, actually, in, in an episode in which he was a guest. Right. Episode 5, I think that was. Right. It, it was not an easy decision. And, of course, there was no October 2020 parade either, but that was because of COVID-19. Again, legitimate reasons not to have a parade it was it was not possible and nobody had parades Mm -hmm. last halloween but back to 2019 there was just like a lot of you know drama on facebook about why why don't you have a rain date and a lot of the bands and the other performers in these parades they're booked every other sunday so even if they had a rain date and it was the following Sunday, you would have been watching like tumbleweeds blow down Main Street because they would be marching in other parades. I don't think that clicked for a lot of people who just kind of didn't seem to want to accept that, you know, no, there there has to be a rain date. You have to have the parade. So that was fresh in my mind. And the fact that Hellertown has traditionally always had a lot of outdoor events and, you know, weather being what it is in Pennsylvania, there's always the concern about whether, you know, a a thunderstorm or something could, you know, wash out the event. So I've had to be very cognizant about advertising rain dates or even snow dates if they exist for these events. Again, this is pre-pandemic, so (laughs) it has not been an issue at all the, the last, you know, year plus, ironically. But Who knew in, you know, October, November of 2019 that, you know, just on the horizon was this incredible life-changing pandemic. So long story short, the name is based on, you know, real events that have taken place in Hellertown and sort of a a humorous spin on them, tongue-in-cheek, and we have a lot of fun with it. We like our umbrella in our you know every episode's cover has the rainbow umbrella in it and it's just a catchy name i think i mean yeah people do not have a, a problem like it. remembering it <laughs> like i've noticed that you usually tell them once what the name is and they remember yeah. so i think i think it was meant to be that, that that was the name that was chosen but yeah so basically what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to introduce some highlights from our favorite interviews some of our favorites from the past year and a half and we're breaking them into categories so there's some organization here we're gonna have highlights from local business interviews interviews related to 
nonprofit organizations and arts in the valley media the media on the media is always a fun topic for me and we've had some fellow journalists on Mm -hmm. and that's that's always enjoyable we are also going to touch on politics and government highlights we would be remiss if we didn't touch on those issues and then we're going to talk about our future goals and we have dreams for this podcast and hope you'll stay with us to hear those So I think all along when I was thinking about having a podcast, one of the primary goals was always going to be to highlight small business in the area. That is still a priority for us, of course. It's something that goes back to my earliest days in journalism, working for the Saucon News, which was a print newspaper covering Hellertown. I did not, you know participate in advertising sales or anything like that back then but I covered a lot of business news and began to learn about the small business community in Hellertown and my love for it has only grown since then 15 years into covering this area I've seen a lot of businesses come I've seen some go but it's been a wonderful experience and I feel privileged to have this platform and I think it only makes sense to use it to help other businesses find new customers and share their unique stories because really every every business has a unique story whether it's a new restaurant or a plumber like to me it doesn't really matter I think this is a great format for uncovering you know the people behind the business and that's something that that doesn't always get explored I think in in mainstream media coverage so we continue to focus on new businesses of course with the podcast but that's not to say that we neglect our friends that are long established business owners in the community right now I'm thinking of Steve Labrate Mm -hmm who has owned Saucon Valley Bikes for over 20 years. They had their 20th anniversary in 2019, actually. And Did we talk to them about that, or was that after? Was that one of the things we talked about him I with on that episode? I think we did talk to him at the very end of 2019. Yeah, so we, maybe he reflected on 20 yes. years of, yeah. That, sounds that was great. our first interview with him. You know, we opened it in 99, and it's, it's pretty cool. I was kind of taking note today. There's 100-plus small businesses on Main Street. There's probably 20 of them that are 20 years or older. So it, it's kind of a rarity to have a small business for 20 years. And, you know, it's really cool that this town has those businesses that have been around forever. You know, you see a lot of co- come and go. I mean, you see restaurants come and go, but uh, it, it's cool to be part of this community for that length of time, you know, and plan on being more, so. <laughs> Steve is the, the real deal. I mean, he's... <laughs> He's somebody who puts himself out there, you know, he's not just in his shop, you know, all the time, but he's involved in the Saucon Rail Trail. He's been on the Rail Trail Commission basically since day one, almost 10 years ago. And he's also involved in a lot of other, you know, worthy causes. So that's something that I like to highlight. It makes for a more dynamic story, obviously, when when you can talk about somebody's community involvement. But we have a lot of businesses like that in Hellertown. Kevin Branco, Main Street Gym, Mm -hmm. is another one that comes to mind. Kevin has been a fixture on Main Street and involved in in the community. He grew up here too. So, you know, he has deep roots here and some others are newer to the area like myself. And Jim Rose, owner of Kindred Spirits, Mm June opened her business about a year after Sock and Source began. Just always enjoyed, you know, going over there, talking to her. That's something I've missed doing during the <laughs> pandemic because, you know, you and I, I know we've talked about this. June and I have talked about this. Mm-hmm. Like Kindred Spirits for me is one of those places that, that you walk into. And, and before the pandemic, that's why I would, you know, 
if you're not familiar with Hellertown, my office is right around the corner from Jane's store. Like, I could go in there and just talk to you, hang out for like half an hour, but now I feel weird doing that anywhere just about because yeah. because it's not purposeful and what if you're spreading something, you yeah. know, like, so that's kind of, that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> it's a bit of a bummer. It's, it's kind of the, you know, it's the current climate where we're at right now, you know, right. it's just, I think, adapting to the current climate and... It felt like the wrong thing to do to just, like, go hang out at a business, you right. know, because you weren't supposed to, hopefully that's coming to an end and, and we can just drop in, mm-hmm. you know places again because that's something i've always enjoyed doing that and you learn so much Mm -hmm. about the business community from doing that the bakery is another example of that like i would go in there and just hang out you know be a fly on the wall kind of especially when we get locked out of the office right one time (laughs) yes i know that's happened to me a few times but (laughs) and that's when you find out who your who your business friends are yeah but yeah, it's in those spaces where, you know, you, you meet other residents, other business owners. That is as important as a lot of the quote unquote traditional journalism that I do mm-hmm. being out there. And like I said, COVID threw a wet blanket on that for the last year. Mm-hmm. So I think it's going to feel really good to be able to say hi again. Mm-hmm. How are you doing? You know. What are challenges that you're facing if, mm-hmm. if you are facing challenges? Not everybody is, thank goodness, but I know some people are, and I think Sock and Source can help, whether it's through a podcast interview with a business owner or some type of story. I was going to say, I, I almost think like, you know, as you're saying that, I almost feel like the podcast has almost sort of been a way to start, you know, drop in on these businesses. You couldn't do it in the traditional sense that you used to where you'd walk in and spend time with them, but... You know, we've had guests on the show who've talked about, you know, what kind of struggles they've had throughout COVID and that sort of thing. So while Mm -hmm. we couldn't, you know, walk down to June's shop quite as much and and hang out with her, we were able to have her and other business owners like her on the show and, you know, sort of do a a virtual COVID kind of drop in that it's not quite the same, but it's, you know, you get a little something out of that rather than just not checking in on these business owners at all. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great point. And and I'm grateful that we've had that ability. You can keep in touch through, you know, Facebook or, or whatever, but it's not necessarily ideal. I think we've only begun to tap this gold mine of the Saucon Valley, greater Saucon Valley business community, mm-hmm. as far as like meeting them here on the podcast, mm-hmm. using this as a kind of intimate space in which their story can be highlighted. I think there's something like 300 businesses in Hellertown. Hmm. Wow. Not all brick and mortar. Yeah. But like, you know, including like the little, you know, online businesses, maybe maybe somebody selling stuff on Etsy. But if they're local, you know, that could still be a really interesting interview. Mm-hmm. We love, you know, meeting new artists and, and so forth. You know, new businesses are obviously in the works too all the time in a mm-hmm. community like this, which is another reason I love covering Hellertown. It's it's not stagnant in any way. We had, I mean, Phil Coxmeyer at Maple Street Woodworking. Mm-hmm. We had him on the show. That was actually ahead of the grand. We actually had him on the show before his business even had their grand opening. So right, you've even used the show to highlight you know forthcoming businesses. Well, just in one case so far, but. You wouldn't mind doing that again yeah i mean as long as you know that you're you're opening like relatively soon it's totally possible to do that i think i'm partial to food businesses <laughs> <laughs> actually we haven't had too many restaurant owners on we've right. had andy lee we had you know chef joe that's food related but yeah not not so much restaurants i think it's because they're they tend to be really busy yeah especially at night and that's when we do our recording of our interviews yes might have to start doing you know like a breakfast sessions with restaurant owners or something to to get them a chance to speak on the show yeah i could be down with that as long as there's coffee we could start with the diner the hellertown diner get some like sounds of the clinking of mm-hmm. glassware and that would be plates neat. yeah <laughs> i would like that the murmur of the people in the background mm-hmm. yeah definitely like the local color would be something fun to explore, I think. 
we don't have all the ideas. I know I don't. I'm always looking for for feedback from people, and you know, maybe somebody out there is listening and thinking, oh, what if they fill in the blank on mm-hmm. that on that no rain date? Drop me a line, like mm-hmm. let me know like what your thoughts are, because I have ideas in the shower. Then I can't remember half of them by the time I'm done. So. <laughs> Any feedback, like I said, is appreciated. And of course, I'm so appreciative of all the business owners that have been on as guests. If I haven't invited you, please consider it an open invitation. If you're if you're somebody in the local area and you have a story to tell, which is, like I said, just about every business owner, we'd love to highlight that on No Rain Day. Another thing that we started kind of focusing on recently with the show is arts and the art scene and I'm kind of glad that we did because I'm sure that the pandemic was hard on artists they can't put on productions they can't perform and do the things that they normally would you know a a global pandemic is pretty much the worst thing that can happen for an artist like that so it was nice to kind of check in on some artists and see what they were doing get their stories what have they been up to over the pandemic I think that's kind of a group of people who might have been a little bit neglected So one of the people we had on was Touchstone Theater, which is a theater company in Southside Bethlehem. We had Emma Ackerman from Touchstone on the show. And I was really impressed by some of the creative things that Touchstone Theater was doing in the wake of COVID, which, you know, I was thinking to myself, that should come as no surprise. I mean, they are artists after all. If anyone can respond to something like that quickly and creatively, it should be them. So they did a lot of cool things, I think, in response to the COVID pandemic. One thing Emma talked about is how they adapted their Young Playwrights Festival and they did like a virtual table read and they were even able to get, you know, some participation from alumni from as far as like France, I think she mentioned. And I I thought that was really cool. But the one that stood out to me was this sci-fi storytelling event, which she called Letters from Afar. And I thought that was really cool just to think about, you know, how does a theater company even come up with this? I think the The general gist of the idea was, you know, the audience, air quotes in this case, was receiving letters from, I think it was your great uncle or something, who's on some quest, you know, in some far off land, and then the audience was supposed to periodically receive these letters from them. Well, and you had to pre-register for it. Right, You didn't just randomly get (laughs) letters. they were just sending letters out to people. (laughs) That would be creepy. That would. But I thought that was... That was really neat, you know, just just to think about how how did they even come up with that idea? And I I was impressed by how proactive they were, because I I remember Emma saying something along the lines of how they really early on in the pandemic kind of foresaw people getting tired of like the Zoom sort of thing. But we also knew that like, well, everyone's going to have so much screen time. It will also be good for us to create art that gets us away from our devices. Yeah, I thought that was cool, too. I mean, it kind of reminded me a little bit of, like, the, like, with movies, like, they have, like, you know, found footage kinds mm-hmm. of films. Yes. It was kind of like that, but with, like, manufactured artifacts right. and writing. And, yeah. and it was, I guess, also, like, a sensory kind of experience because you got this in the mail and then mm-hmm. you could, like, hold these things and, and explore them, mm-hmm. like, in your own time. And, like, I wish I had known about it sooner because i would have registered to do it right I it was really maybe they'll do something like that again yeah sometime. yeah that's a good point the whole idea of you know taking something physical from it it's not something that a you know a theater company would probably normally offer but you know the the pandemic certainly forced them to you know put on their thinking hats and i was just really impressed by what they came up with so that that was really cool and I think we also heard some pretty impressive adapting by the Bach Choir, who was another recent guest that we had on the show. And Josh, you mm-hmm. have, you know, family connections, and I know that was probably a fun interview for you to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with my, my mom singing in the choir and my grandfather as well. So I don't want to say I took it for granted, but I always had a connection to it mm-hmm. through family. As a publisher, you know, I, I get their, all their news releases and since the beginning of the pandemic you know i've been following them they had a lot of disappointments because of covid Mm -hmm. they were planning a trip to europe in the summer of 2020 that Mm -hmm. was postponed and ultimately it was canceled just because you know it doesn't really make sense i guess to try and go on that particular trip anymore right but we found a lot of positive things to talk about in addition to the, the history of the choir 
Greg Funfgel, the artistic director and conductor, shared how positive it's been for them to connect with new audiences mm-hmm. online through the use of technology, streaming, of course. And that is something that I think they will continue to do like well into the future. I mean, I hope they I hope they do because with music, I mean, you want to reach as many people as, as you can. Mm-hmm. And certainly a performance that you're taking in in person is not going to be exactly the same as, you know, watching it on a screen. But mm-hmm. if they can uh, inspire more people, I know they want to do that. Yeah. And, yeah. And maybe in, a, you know, in the future, we'll go back to their Bach at noon in-person performances and stuff like that. But maybe they've learned a couple of tricks, you know, about how to take what they're doing into the virtual world and use them both moving forward. So maybe they learned some things throughout the pandemic. I'm sure they have. Yeah, and I did want to mention, too, that, I mean, pre-pandemic, right at the start, we did have musical guests lined up, and then, right. unfortunately, everything just came to a halt, mm-hmm. and it took us a little while to get back to the arts, basically. Right. But we had a couple groups or singers that we were planning to interview, and still hoping that, you know, that'll happen again, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll do some outreach in the future, and certainly we're open to requests, you know, Mm -hmm. if if you're a a local band or musician, Mm -hmm. performer, feel free to reach out to us, because we don't know everybody (laughs) that's part of the scene. We were also discussing the local high school scene, and we have an incredibly rich musical theater community and particularly within schools the freddie awards Mm -hmm. are well known and i'm always amazed by the shows that high school students put on today and once they are able to do that again like i would love to feature some of those students yeah and and also feature some of the the actual work of these musical guests too as we got to do with the Bach choir I thought that was fun just from a production standpoint getting to actually if you go back and listen to that episode you'll hear Bach choir recordings in that episode which is really cool and so we welcome that opportunity for you know musical guests we'll have in the future it's it's a cool way to kind of interject your music into the episode which I think is fun for the listeners but then you're also kind of exposing your music to an audience so and I also artists. want to give a shout out to This Way to the Egress, who has provided our, our opening and closing music since day one. Yep. Um, they're an awesome local band, and I still want to have them on at some point. Mm-hmm. With the bigger groups, it's a little, little challenging, especially <laughs> now, because of the number of people. But I'm sure we'll, we'll figure out something. And they had a new album come out in the fall, I believe, mm-hmm. which was recorded just before COVID, I think. So we'll circle back to Egress at some point, but definitely look up their music and support those guys. Support our entire, you know, Lehigh Valley art scene as much as you can. They were never in a great position, Mm -hmm. you know, compared to some industries. (laughs) As an artist, you're you're always like trying to figure out a way to make ends meet. And Mm -hmm. that's, that's another reason that it's really important to me to provide a platform for these individuals and groups to talk about their art because you do make a lot of sacrifices in the name of being a creator and I think that deserves recognition. I'll never take that for for granted, I hope. I'm a creator too, but not in that way. Like <laughs> the, the pureness of, you right. know, painting something or sculpting or singing is is different than writing news. I'm not trying to put myself in the same league as Egress or Touchstone Theater or anything like that, but I think I have a respect for them because I know the process of creativity Mm -hmm. and and how challenging it can be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you feel alone doing it. So Mm -hmm. we want them to to know that that they have a lot of, you know, friends in the area. And I'm sure they do, Mm -hmm. but never never hurts to make new ones so absolutely that's not. where that's where uh, no rain date can help and another recent effort of ours with the show that we've been doing recently is featuring candidates in local elections and i think that the podcast is a, a good way to feature that sort of thing because you give candidates in local elections platform to talk about not just policy and you know the community they wish to serve and that sort of thing, but you also get to learn a little bit about the candidate themselves, maybe more than you would in just a typical you know debate setting or anything like that. 
this came up when we had Amy Zanelli and then Van Scott on the show. Star Trek actually is my entire inspiration for politics. I don't know if I should say that really? out loud, but it is. I wanna, um, you have to yeah, explain I, that, I think. <laughs> well, if you want to understand that connection, you have to look at the next generation. The next generation is really about committee meetings in space and diplomatic relations in space. It's how can we be better and how can we not judge? How can we recognize our own biases, right? Which is similar. We hear a lot right now about white privilege and recognizing your white privilege. Well, if you turn on an episode of Star Trek, half of it is them encountering a new species and dealing with their privilege of being you know, the Federation. How do we incorporate this new species without being judgmental? How do we learn to talk with them? How do we learn to see what their needs are? How can we compromise between what, what we want and they want to get with something we both need? So yeah. I work closely with the Northeast Ministries, which is currently called the Northeast Community Center, and they had a special mission, and that mission meant a lot to me, and their mission was basically to assist the residents in that community with their basic needs and to empower them in obtaining their highest potential. We had Christmas parties, we had Easter egg hunts, we gave out Thanksgiving dinners, we did clothing drives. I worked very closely with Stevie Gobble. Uh, he was a very well-known member in the community that worked for the ministries for many years. He unexpectedly died, I wanna say maybe seven, eight years ago. We held cookouts for the kids, we, we had the parents involved. So it was a very well, deserving job that I was a part of. Can you talk a little bit more about featuring local candidates and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that was not something I ever thought of when I was first thinking about No Rain Date and the podcast. I never really thought of using it as a vehicle to inform voters about local elections, mm -hmm. but I think maybe partly because of COVID-19 and the fact that it's been harder for candidates to get their message out in person that may have helped plant the seed in my mind that it was a good idea to do that. I mean, traditionally, yeah, you have candidates knocking on doors mm -hmm. in elections. They haven't been able to do that for the past year. Amy Zanelli, I've known for a couple years, mainly because she's a fellow Fountain Hill resident mm -hmm. and she's also on the Lehigh County Board of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. And when she announced that she was running for district judge for Fountain Hill and West Bethlehem, I initially thought of it just as a Fountain Hill story mm -hmm. for the news site for Sock and Source. But then I thought, well, you know, we can expand on that yeah. in a podcast interview. And that turned out to be really informative. And that led to the interview with Van, Van Scott, Scott, who's also running it's a good platform for this type of exposure for the candidates it benefits the candidates and it benefits voters yeah first and foremost that's why we're doing it and i certainly am interested in having additional candidates in local races on after the primary mm -hmm. we don't have time to there are a lot of candidates in, in the primaries and it would not be possible to have them all on before May 18th, but after the primary election, when we know, you know, which races are competitive, mm -hmm. we will assess those, you know, races mm -hmm. and hopefully have other candidates on and separately because we want to give each person the same opportunity to talk about their views and, you know, ask the same questions. Mm -hmm. And then we hope that that will be useful for for our listeners, I, I know I've enjoyed learning more about them and with the amount of not just information, but disinformation that is bombarding our society before each election, I think we need as much in-depth reporting as mm -hmm. possible. And I realize that it's also not always easy to read like a long guide mm -hmm. because some of these races, if you have, say you have four or five candidates in a race, and you're asking them each just a, a couple questions. Mm -hmm. Well, the finished you know, guide to the race or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. could easily be 2,500, 3,000 right. words. That adds up quick. Right. So it may be easier to process the information by listening to mm -hmm. it. You know, you can be doing something else at the same time. Yeah. I don't know. I'd love to hear from mm -hmm. our listeners about that and what they think about using 
Noreen Date as a as a vehicle for mm-hmm. this sort of public service, mm-hmm. which is how I'm thinking of it. Yeah, um, I agree. The League of Women Voters, of course, is a is an organization that's really involved in disseminating candidate questionnaires, mm-hmm. and that's great. But they probably don't reach you mm-hmm. know everybody and. Maybe we can fill in some of those gaps. Right. And of course, you know, we won't be covering all the Lehigh Valley races, but more so like Southern Lehigh area, Saucon Valley area, Mm -hmm. Fountain Hill. There's some overlap, you know, with with the way the lines are drawn. Mm -hmm. And it is a local election year. I I realize some people are burned out probably from (laughs) elections after 2020, but local elections are really important Mm -hmm. i feel like i'm beating a dead horse when i say that (laughs) and people roll their eyes but when you're talking about the taxes you pay and the services that define your quality of life Mm -hmm. like those are the outcomes of local elections how many times have we seen an election decided by like one vote or two votes it's definitely happened in like the small communities we cover. Right. So I hope that this year will break the trend of, you know, paltry turnout <laughs> at local elections, which sometimes is only like 20%. <laughs> if people are, are more interested, then they're, you know, more likely to vote. And so hopefully our interviews will inspire people and give them that motivation. The last day to register to vote is May 3rd if you want to vote in the primary. And course we promote that on sock and source with our coverage and you can find a lot more information about registering to vote at pavotes.com one other area that we have focused on with the show is the media itself and this came up in we actually had two episodes about this one was with tom sofield who is the publisher of Levittown now, which is similar to what Sock and Source is, just focusing on that area. And Josh, you worked with him at Patch a while ago. Mm-hmm. And then we also had Liz Kepner, who was a CBS3 anchor for years. And so she was really interesting to talk to as well. And I thought just from my standpoint, it was interesting to hear you talk about other you know, reporters and people in the media industry and just kind of hearing you guys talk about the media in general and how you cover things and that sort of thing. One area of the Tom conversation I thought was really interesting was when you guys were talking about different high-profile news stories you guys have covered throughout your careers. And the one that Tom brought up that was really interesting was the Cosmo DiNardo case, and it was really interesting to hear him talk about covering something that then had the national spotlight on as well, and I thought he, he just said a lot of really interesting things about that. There was media from all over by the end of the week, pretty much all over the, the world following it. And it was this bizarre case where this guy, Cosmo DiNardo, had some mental health issues and behavior problems, ended up killing four young guys at his family's farm up by Peddler's Village in the in Solbury Township in central Bucks County. But these four victims, three were from Bucks County and one was from Montgomery County. They were kind of from all parts of the county. So one, one lived just a few minutes from where our office is here in Langhorn. Another lived a few minutes away in Newtown. Uh, so there was a real local angle to it. And it was unique to cover because we had covered the, the one young man who went missing, Dean Finicaro. We covered him over the weekend when he was first reported as a missing person. And it wasn't until more than 24 hours later, it started to come together that something really bad had happened. Hmm. And it turned out in the end, Cosmo DiNardo and his cousin, Sean Kratz of Philadelphia, had murdered the four of them and tried to cover it up. We had a pretty exhaustive police investigation that involved everyone from the FBI to local police from Bucks County, Montgomery County, and and New Jersey ended up cracking the case and recovering the bodies, and and the case had conspiracy theories linked to it. I still get emails from all different parts of the country and even the world about the case, but it was just an interesting case to see how some of the national media and tabloids come in and, in all honesty, how they misreported the story. Right. But even local residents were citing their reporting just because I think if they see it on CNN or Fox News or New York Times, they were you know they were kind of enthralled with them covering their community instead of us who were the the local guys who were covering it i've never covered anything that high profile and yeah and i'm probably okay with that <laughs> because it's it's intense when you're covering an investigation like mm-hmm. that and and it's just going from well that lasted weeks if not months mm-hmm. so you really don't have a lot of time for other things mm-hmm. but the other news doesn't stop 
it would be very challenging with the, the resources mm-hmm. that that we have currently to you know do everything while covering a case that big mm-hmm. but like i said it hasn't really happened here that we've had anything that big right in, in the last 15 years that i've been covering news here when there is a big news story people are tremendously supportive mm-hmm. like i get calls text messages emails you know i just heard this or mm-hmm. you know and then you follow up and maybe it takes you in a, in a new direction but that's what we do mm-hmm. i mean that's that's why i love what i do because every time you get those leads and you know you're the first one that has it uh-huh. it's like an adrenaline rush yeah and you know tips can come from from anywhere mm-hmm. i mean I always have an open mind and try to, you know, make everybody feel valued mm-hmm. when they contribute something, even if it's minor, you know, mm-hmm. it turns out to be minor, you know, you, you have to thank people for, for taking the time to reach out to you mm-hmm. because time is valuable and I, I could have a thought, oh, well, you know, this would really benefit this journalist to know that. Mm-hmm. And oh, I don't have time. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> like, but people make time if they feel it's important, and and if they feel it's important, then I owe them the you know courtesy of looking into it as much as necessary. And I do try and do that. So I think that's one of the reasons that I've been able to maintain a lot of relationships and grow them over the years. And yeah, you really learn who your friends are <laughs> when you are covering one of these stories. I mean. We've covered big weather events, you know, that's, that's something that, that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Like flooding is a big issue in Helena yeah. Town. And, and I know last August that. when we had the remnants of Hurricane Isai East mm-hmm. come through, Hellertown had a flash flood. I actually wasn't in town, but it wouldn't have mattered because our office building was surrounded by water, right. so I probably wouldn't have been able to get inside. <laughs> People sent me video of, Mm -hmm. you know, flooding and photos, and and I was able to do a great job of reporting thanks to sources that were, you know, tagging me and things they had already shared on social media Mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, people sometimes tell me, you know, it seems like you're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) they could say that, and I was at home working all day. Uh But because I'm, like, compiling all this source material in a way that makes sense, it does give that impression, I guess. Yeah, I could, so. I could absolutely see that. Yeah, and I think similar, you guys were talking about similar things too with like Liz Kepner. I thought that was like a really fascinating interview just to sit and listen to you guys talk. And she obviously has a, a really incredible career in, in the media in general. As I mentioned before, she was an anchor at CBS3 in Philly for a number of years. One of the things she's doing now is teaching at Penn State Lehigh Valley. She was telling us about how She teaches her students about news deserts, and I thought you guys had a really interesting conversation about news deserts, and it's obviously topical for us here at Sock and Source. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think news desert is is a term that many people are still sort of becoming familiar with, but essentially it's, it's an area that lacks a comprehensive, reliable source of local news, Mm -hmm. and Fortunately, in the Lehigh Valley, we really don't have news deserts, but in other parts of the state and certainly the country, they've Mm -hmm. become pretty commonplace. And a lot of that is because family newspapers were no longer profitable Mm -hmm. and went out of business or got gobbled up by media conglomerates who then shut them down. We're still seeing a lot of hedge fund purchases of, of papers and what that tends to do is strip the guts out of them, mm-hmm. out of the workforce behind them, and then you're left with something that's not even really authentically local. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that also contributes to the phenomenon of news deserts. I mean, I would argue that there are not just news deserts, there are news savannas where mm-hmm. it could become a desert. Mm-hmm. It's drying up in terms of like the coverage. Mm-hmm. Are we in that in the Lehigh Valley? Probably not, but we're not really moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. I personally, ever since I started Sock and Source in 2014, have hoped to see other independent news sites started mm-hmm. in the Lehigh Valley and throughout the region in Southeast Pennsylvania. Tom and I, even though we both cover parts of Bucks County, Bucks County is huge mm-hmm. and he's at the extreme southern end and I'm at the extreme northern end, so we can't really 
collaborate on coverage very much. We share ideas for features, and, and we were talking the other day about like newspapers.com, and Tom likes to publish like a, a story from 100 years ago about uh-huh. Levittown or Bristol, and I thought that was a great idea, so I'm planning to do something similar mm-hmm. for our area. So those relationships benefit our readers mm-hmm. tremendously, but I can't have them if <laughs> there aren't any other companies around that do what I do. I hope that the tide is going to turn and we're going to see more startups. There are definitely organizations that are trying to foster that, like mm-hmm. the group I'm in, the Local Independent Online Publishers or Lion Group, which is like an association of independent uh, publishers nationwide. The Center for Cooperative Media in New Jersey, I got a lot of great assistance from them when I was planning to start Sock and Source about seven years ago mm-hmm. after my patch career ended so yeah i mean liz and i definitely different sides of the same coin because she worked in in tv which is a higher echelon mm-hmm. of coverage but we both believe in the same f- fundamental principles mm-hmm. and she definitely expressed a lot of you know appreciation for you know what we do right i mean it's at a micro type of level Mm -hmm. but there's no macro without the micro Mm -hmm. in news Mm -hmm. like you you have to have this foundation of local news sources throughout the country Mm -hmm. really for our democracy to be what it can be and and continue to be great so that's another reason i've started a membership program too because even though we have advertisers that support us in order to continue to report and grow our coverage area there really needs to be some level of buy-in from Mm -hmm. from readers and I want it to be voluntary I do not want to have a paywall if possible ever that is a trend in publishing I mean you don't have to browse very much online to run into one Mm -hmm. and do you try and get around it do you you know never visit that site again you know it comes down to how much you value the news Mm -hmm. but at least with the membership program i think it's i hope it's forcing people to think about the news we produce and what it means to them and how it helps them live better lives Mm -hmm. if it's at least doing that it's a start I'm not saying everybody can afford to become a member. Maybe maybe you can't, but then you can help out in other ways. You can share content yeah. on social media. You can be a source. Everybody in the community can play a role in supporting local news somehow. Sure. And it's only going to work, really, when there is widespread support. Another thing I wanted to mention, too, is that going back to News Desert, Saucon Valley had a print newspaper of its own for 32 years. Mm -hmm. They shut down in 2020, the Valley Voice. And some people that I've run into recently still don't know that they're no longer publishing. (laughs) It was a print newspaper, but they covered a lot of things related to local government, business, Mm -hmm. stories that I didn't always have. So it's a loss, I mean, for the community, and I don't think it should be minimized. That leaves us as the only sort of exclusive Saucon Valley publication Mm -hmm. at this point. That's another reason I need member support, because we have more gaps to fill now. Mm -hmm. So I also wanted to mention that in this era of misinformation, there are sources that seek to portray themselves as authentic local news, (laughs) <laughs> online, but really aren't. They're following a politically driven agenda, or they're simply taking other people's content mm-hmm. and aggregating it. No original content. So you have to be wary of these sites. One of them, which I won't name, one of the things I've noticed them doing is using obituaries as clickbait. They'll find an obituary of a local young person who died, oh, wow. and then kind of give it a headline, you know, that includes their age and and use their picture. And it's clickbait, you know, and it's that makes me feel icky. You know, (laughs) like I don't I don't like the idea that that somebody is exploiting a young person's death for for clicks on their website. And, you know, of course, we publish obituaries, but we do it responsibly. We don't try to 
exploit the tragedy of a young person's death mm -hmm. for whatever the reason. I mean, I want people to be more aware of what they're what they're looking at, what they're clicking on. If it says the name of of your community in the masthead, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an authentic news source. Right. You need to like click on the about us and Google names, like find out who's behind these companies. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do that. Any, everybody has the internet. You know, it just comes down to fundamental curiosity. And I think people have to do that for themselves in a lot of cases because I can say this is a journalism that's poorly done or, mm -hmm. you know, shoddy news coverage. And people will not necessarily believe it because they know that I'm in the business and maybe they think that I'm not, you know, I'm not willing to recognize competition that right. because it's competition. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. I mean... I support plenty of reputable news organizations, and you can see that in my reporting where I link out to them. Those are all choices that are based on the quality of the work they do. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty passionate about, you know, the media landscape and being part of it mm -hmm. and, and wanting it to be, you know, more robust because ultimately our communities will be the ones who benefit, not just Hellertown and Lower Saucon, like all the surrounding areas, which were trying to cover but you know it's a challenge to do it consistently you know there are multiple meetings you know municipal meetings mm -hmm. like every month and just that alone requires a, a considerable amount of manpower and budgeting if you're in one of those communities like fountain hill or coopersburg or upper bucks a springfield and you know of something going on or hear of a, a new business that's opening or, you know, a hot button topic that's being discussed, you know, let let us know. Like we're not all seeing omnipotent newspaper people. So mm -hmm. would appreciate that. Right. And news deserts was one desert that came up on the show recently, but another one that came up was the idea of a food desert. And that came up in our, our conversation with Carol Ritter from the Bethlehem Food Co-op. And that, that's part of a growing collection of interviews we've done with nonprofits. That's become something that we've focused on lately. And actually, I mean, we, we've kind of focused on them throughout the, the history of the show. I think the Allentown Rescue Mission was one of, you know, that was a pretty early on interview that we had. But with Carol Ritter and the food desert, that was pretty interesting. I thought that was a cool conversation. One thing I thought was interesting was she was talking about the physical location of the Bethlehem Food Co-op during our interview with them, and that was something that was sort of forthcoming. We want our store to be walkable for many citizens. Right. So that's why it's going to be located in downtown Bethlehem somewhere. We haven't announced the location yet. Our board of directors knows the location, but uh, we have some wonderful partners. We have so many people in this community involved, including the city of Bethlehem. The mayor is a member. Almost all of the city council people are a member. Mm -hmm. uh, our local politicians are members of the co-op. They want this to happen. They believe in it, and they know that it's a. it will be good for Bethlehem, and we'd love it to see it become a destination. So we're going to have big produce department, I'm sure, but there'll be a meat counter. There'll be everything a store has. You know, uh, we'll have the dry goods, frozen foods, things of that nature. And, you know, we were able to follow up on that and report on that when they finally did have, mm -hmm. their, which they recently announced their physical location. But we've focused on nonprofits of all sorts of sizes. We've had nonprofits that are kind of local chapters of a national organization. Meals on Wheels would be an example of that. And then we've also had some some very sort of hyper local nonprofits like the Saucon Valley Lions, which was an interview that I know both of us really enjoyed. And you could probably talk a little bit more about that interview yeah I mean it was it was wonderful to have the the Lions on several months ago this was before the holidays they're an organization with nearly a century of history mm -hmm. in this area which hopefully that means they're not taken for granted uh -huh. uh, unfortunately I think many of the the local smaller groups like the Lions that have devoted themselves to improving life in the community by doing things like building, you know, pavilions over the years. And well, the first one of the first projects we had was to build school bus shelters back in the 50s. Something I actually got to use and didn't realize it until <laughs> later on in life that where they came from. I just assumed that the school had, had, had supplied them, but here it was actually the Saucon Valley Lions Club. We built two pavilions across the, the community, one over by uh, the municipal building on uh, Old Bethlehem Pike. It's a nice brick 
pavilion with a fireplace and, and a real nice set up there. We built that one. They host the annual Gem and Mineral Show yes. at the high school. These groups, in many cases, are struggling to stay viable mm-hmm. just because the average age of a member is probably maybe 60, mm-hmm. and it's not going down. Younger people are not interested, in many cases, in volunteering their time to an organization like that. They, you know, both spouses work today. Mm-hmm. When you're not working, you probably want to spend time with your family. Right. So that's that's something that's changed. And so I don't know what the future is for these organizations, but certainly as long as they're around, like we want to support them however we can by promoting, you know, events, fundraisers when they are able to have them and just, you know, reminding people that that they're in the community and and about what they do. We were discussing this earlier, and and I think that the larger nonprofits, it is a little easier to interview them because they're more media savvy, probably. And we have interviewed a number of Lehigh Valley-wide groups recently. But certainly, I hope to continue to interview um, groups like the Lions in the future. They do a lot of good, good work in the community, and it deserves to be recognized, so... If you're somebody from, you know, one of these one of these groups, another one I just thought of is the local educational foundation, which mm-hmm. does a lot for students. They fundraise for educational programs that aren't funded by the district budget. So these are sort of things like above and beyond what the district budget's for. They raise the money to create the environmental center uh, at Saucon Valley a few years ago. For example, that's just mm-hmm. one of the things that they've done. I would love to, you know, interview somebody from that group. And, and that's just one example. Right. Uh, there are many groups like that. So we won't be uh, short of interview subjects. <laughs> that's for sure. So obviously with anything you develop, like a podcast, you always want to do more with it. You want to do better. You follow other podcasts and pick up ideas from listening to them Mm -hmm. and we're no different here at No Rain Day. We want to, you know, continue to grow our audience and provide additional ways to take in the information that we have as part of this podcast and make it more more useful too. So some of the things that we've talked about are possibly creating like more of a video component for the podcast, which would obviously necessitate a a little investment in technology Mm -hmm. but that would also make our current uploads on youtube a lot more engaging and you would be able to see our guests and body language and well when we have guests yeah (laughs) because we haven't so that's another reason that there's been no rush to to do that but but i think there's a lot of potential for for that also Bringing in guests on a regular or semi-regular basis to talk about things like health-related issues or business and real estate, just for a minute or two, like to, and to provide a local perspective on those issues, I think that could be very informative for our listeners. Mm-hmm. We've had some conversations with folks about that, possibly as, as sponsored segments, if it's a business. So we're going to continue to have those conversations and and see what develops. Advertising as part of podcasts is not unusual at all. It would help support the, you know, continued development of the podcast and investment in technology. Another thing we've dreamed about a little bit, I have since day one, is, you know, taking the podcast out of the office here and into a public space where we could, you know, potentially record with an audience at a business, like a restaurant, maybe a museum. You know, there are a lot of possibilities, and and I think that would be fun and obviously expand our our audience, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) by introducing it to other people. And I think for certain subjects, when you're interviewing on-site, it makes for a better interview. Absolutely. Like if you're talking about art and you're surrounded by art, you know, in a museum setting... I think that's going to result in a richer kind of interview. So those are just, you know, ideas and, you know, we'll see what develops, but we're definitely open to exploring them. 
we're excited about that. I'm a believer in, you know, if you if you dream it, you know, you can do it. And that's sort of been my guiding principle with Sock and Source all along. So there's no reason not to follow it for no rain date. You know, we welcome our listeners' ideas too, of course. If you have them, you can always connect with us online. Email me at josh at sockandsource.com if you have feedback you know constructive criticism what have you i would love to hear it so it's been great having you with us for these past 50 episodes and we're excited about the next 50 no rain date is an original production of sock and source llc our theme music is provided by this way to the egress for more great music by them be sure to follow this way to the egress on spotify Thank you for listening. Every night he climbs the tower, sees your face on every tower.